They don't have a motion. Okay, I'd like to call the meeting to order. Yeah, there's the official minute. And uh, the first thing we have to deal with is uh, a motion filed by France Gellerness requesting the Auditor General to examine the estimated cost of the cancelled nuclear reactors at Darlington Nuclear Generating Station. And Ms. For Forster, go ahead. Thank you. So we don't uh, intend to proceed with the motion that Ms. Gellerna uh, tabled on October the 23rd. Uh, but we do have a, another motion that we'd like to table today and deal with uh, next week. Okay, very well. Well, we'll get it from you. Okay, so we have a, a seeing as we're not going to be talking about that motion this morning, then there's a few items uh, of correspondence that should remain confidential, so we shall go into closed session to discuss those prior to having our witness this morning. So we will go into closed session now. Okay, I'd like to call the committee to order. And uh, welcome from uh, Transport Canada, Mr. Emi Walji, Associate Director, Operations West Civil Aviation, and Mr. Yves Lemieux, Assistant Associate Director, Operations East Civil Aviation. Welcome to the committee. Thank you for taking the time to come in this morning and to confirm that you've received a letter for, uh, with information about uh, someone coming before the committee. And uh, our clerk will have you do either an affirmation or oath. So I'll, I'll just start with Mr. Walji, if you could just raise your right hand. Mr. Walji, do you solemnly affirm that the evidence you shall give to this committee touching the subject of the present inquiry is for the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lemieux, same thing. Thank you. Mr. Lemieux, do you solemnly affirm that the evidence you shall give to this committee touching the subject of the present inquiry is for the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Thank you. Good. And you have up to 20 minutes for a statement. You use as much or little time as you like of that, and then we'll go to questioning from the three parties. Okay, so good morning, Mr. Chair and uh, members of the Standing Committee. Uh, I am Amy Walji, Associate Director for Operations West, and my colleague is uh, Yves Lemieux, Acting Associate Director, Operations East. We both represent Transport Canada Civil Aviation Ontario Region. Uh, as Associate Directors, we are accountable for the effective and efficient management of the Civil Aviation Safety Oversight Program. For the enterprises we are assigned within the industry in Ontario, and to support the safety of civil aviation within Canada's borders. Some of our responsibilities include conducting audits and inspections, managing and overseeing all service validation and assessment activities associated with various enterprises. These enterprises are comprised of air carriers, airports, heliports, manufacturers, flight schools and maintenance organizations. All this work is done under the authority of the Canadian Aviation Regulations and the Aeronautics Act, while overseeing the integration of safety, intelligence and application of risk management processes and procedures. Civil Aviation's mission is to develop and administer policies and regulations for the safest civil aviation system for Canada while using a system-based approach to managing risks. This mission is based on the concept that intervention strategies such as rulemaking, oversight and certification are tools used to mitigate risk. While members of the aviation industry are our direct clients, the Canadian public is ultimately the beneficiary of our services. Transport Canada defines safety as the condition to which risks are managed to acceptable levels. Through the aviation safety oversight, civil aviation verifies the aviation industry's compliance with the regulations through two sub-activities, service to the aviation industry and surveillance of the aviation safety. While the end product of service is the delivery of a certificate, license, or other documents to an aviation stakeholder, the underlying purpose of these activities is for the department
to reasonably assure itself that individuals, organizations, and or aeronautical products can operate safely and in compliance with applicable regulatory requirements. Transport Canada con uh, conducts system-based surveillance of the aviation system to monitor the aviation industry for compliance with the regulatory framework. This is done through a risk-based approach, primarily through assessments and inspections. Transport Canada is evolving the manner in which it approaches its surveillance responsibilities of all enterprises it regulates. This evolution in approach is consistent with the principles of safety management systems where the enterprise is expected to take an ownership role in proactively managing their safety risks on an ongoing basis. Transport Canada's role is to ensure that all enterprises have effective systems and processes in place for complying with regulatory requirements the department's surveillance activities confirm that these systems remain effective. The ultimate aim of surveillance is to monitor compliance with regulatory requirements. To that end, all enterprises have an obligation to comply with the regulatory requirements at all times. Should a surveillance activity uncover any instances of non-compliance with the regulations, the department will take appropriate action. Findings of non-compliance are meant to have enterprises correct their systems in such a way that they return to compliance and maintain that state. Regardless of the form of the action, the onus is on the enterprise to maintain compliance with regulatory requirements. Transport Canada surveillance activities fall under two broad categories, planned and unplanned where unplanned surveillance includes all those surveillance activities conducted in response to an unforeseen event or issue, for example, an accident, incident, increase in an enterprise risk indicator level, etc. And planned surveillance includes all those surveillance activities conducted at a predetermined interval in accordance with Transport Canada's approved surveillance plan. Transport Canada is taking a standardized, risk-based approach to planning surveillance activities across all operational areas, taking into account all available safety information regarding approved enterprises. Surveillance policy details the process through which risk-based intervals are assigned for conducting planned surveillance activities. Planned surveillance intervals range from one year to five years depending on the risk profile of an organization. Both Eve and I are here to respond to your questions on Transport Canada's regulatory oversight role. Uh, we thank you for giving us the opportunity to appear today and welcome your questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank, thank you very much for that opening statement. We'll start with the opposition. Uh, Mr. Cleese, and we'll go with 20-minute rotations to begin with and then see how much time we have. Dr. Go ahead, Mr. Cleese. <clears throat> thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Mr. Walji and Mr. Lemieux, for uh, joining us today. Um, <clears throat> Transport Canada conducted uh, two program validation inspections uh, at Orange Bases between January 9th and January 24th of this year. Uh, you describe the safety management system under which uh, you're working. Can you explain to us just very briefly what is the purpose uh, of these program validation inspections uh, and how often are they conducted? You did say that they're conducted anywhere from one to five years, uh, was it? Correct. Depending on the risk profile of an organization. So. Uh, with regard to Orange, uh, could you just give us a, a sense of where Orange fits into that risk profile and uh, how often do you conduct these, uh, these reports? Okay, so I'll, I'll start with giving a very quick background on our uh, policy and, and how we do our risk profiling. And, and just to set it within context, Orange has got two companies. Uh, one is the fixed wing operation which was approved uh, back in 2009, and uh, they also have an approved maintenance organization under the fixed wing operation, which was approved in 2011. 
And the rotary wing is a company called 7506406 Canada Inc., which was approved in 2012. So that's just the context of the organization. So when we look at our planning and how we do our risk-based profile, so we have our policy document which says that we have our uh, system called NACIMS, which is the National Aviation Safety Information Management System, which has about you know, 60 to 70 questions where we populate based upon our knowledge of an organization. So for example, it asks you questions on has the company had a turnover in staff? Has the company grown in size? Has the company got any labor difficulties? So we start populating those answers. So that gives us a risk value. Then the next step we look at is the, what is the uh, risk profile of this company in the sense of its complexity. How many bases does it have? How many aircraft does it operate? Is it an international operation? Does it have a safety management system in place? And then we tabulate the results of that and we get a risk index. And then we look at what is the impact value of an organization, right? So the impact value is based upon the, the companies on whether you know, they have a high profile, are they uh, going to be in, a, in an area which is going to be a risky area. So when we tabulate this thing, we use what is known as a safety, uh, sorry, a surveillance indicator matrix. And once we plot that, it gives us a surveillance value which says that you will do a program validation inspection at a one-year period, a two-year period, a three-year period, four-year period, or a five-year period. Now, one thing to remember very clearly here is that the risk profile does not identify whether the company is in non-compliance of regulations or whether it is safe or unsafe. What it is, it shows a change in the state of the organization. So when we populate it, we say the, person, the company is in a stable situation. So let's say now they add a few aircraft, so we populate our system and it, it shows a change. So we get a change in the number. So this risk profile is simply a methodology for us to determine where does the company sit in terms of managing change. Okay? I thank you for that. That's very helpful. Uh, could I ask you where Orange fits into that risk profile? Okay, so let's look at uh, the 7506406 Canada Inc., which is the rotary wing, and like I mentioned, it was approved in 2012. When in 2012? Uh, the certificate was issued in January 16, 2012. Okay. So because that is a new company, and when I talked in my opening remarks, we talked about we do our surveillance based on service and oversight. And when we talk about service, we say service includes issuing of a certificate, a document, or a license. So when a company like, well, I'm not sure it's orange, but it says 7506406 Canada Inc. was approved, we ensured that the company met the minimum re regulatory requirements at the time, which says they do have a qualified crew, they have uh, maintenance requirements for their aircraft, they have an infrastructure in place. So that sets our baseline based on our risk profile. And then we say, okay, because this is a new operation, it is in an in a area which is of a very uh, uh, risky operation because of the way that they operate their helicopters, they are doing a, a service. We want to assure ourselves that they are maintaining regulatory compliance. So we look, give them one year. And the reason why we say one year, because if you look at the maintenance requirements of an air operator, it says, when a new certificate is issued, the air operator has got 12 months in which to conduct their internal audit. So when they conduct an internal audit, our expectation is that they are identifying all their shortcomings and they are fixing them and rectifying them so they don't go into non-compliance. So we come in after a year to ensure that the company is still maintaining the regulatory compliance. Okay, I'd like to uh, then move on to uh, and again, we're dealing with now the Rotary Wing uh, report uh, that was dated March 1, 2013, in a letter. Uh, Transport Canada uh, advised Orange uh, that on-site interviews uh, with key personnel had taken place. There was a sampling of records and uh, observance of work uh, at the base. And Transport Canada inspectors, according to that letter, 
have found a number of non-conformances uh, to the company operations manual as well as Canadian aviation regulations. Uh, for the record, uh, Chair, this is uh, PVI uh, file 5015-17559-17. Uh, so uh, I'm reading from the Transport Canada letter uh, dated March 1st, 2013. This was addressed to Mr. Robert Jaguer, who is the accountable executive. I quote, uh, for the record, there were strong indicators that areas of the operational control system were not effective. On-site interviews revealed confusion, both at the management level and with flight crews. The letter goes on to confirm that operations at some bases were suspended as a result of those findings. I quote again from the letter, flight crew members who had not completed the entire flight and ground training program were removed from flight operations until all training requirements were met. Additionally, flight operations at some bases were temporarily suspended until all program requirements were complete." End of quote. Uh, is it a common occurrence uh, with uh, the operations uh, over which you have responsibility that flight operations uh, would be suspended by Transport Canada following uh, one of these uh, inspections? Is that something that, that you see happen uh, commonly? Uh, Mr. Chair, there will be speculation on my part to answer. If I see that commonly, I will I'd like to speak with the policy on how we address these shortcomings when they are identified at the PBI based on our policy and procedures which we adhere to. So in this particular instance, when the uh, shortcomings were identified by the PVI team at Orange, the company took their own uh, actions of saying, we will not dispatch any more crew unless we train them. So the actions were taken by the company uh, in this particular instance. So, so I find it interesting uh, that uh, they have now been operating for a, an entire year. And these uh, non-conformances had been in place for a year. There were nine of them. Uh, four were classified as moderate, two were classified as major, and three were classified as critical. And of those critical, the three critical classifications, they were related to flight crew training and particularly uh, in light of concerns that this committee uh, has heard from uh, witnesses over the last number of months that, uh, that the issue of training uh, was of serious concerns, had actually been reported according to testimony that we've had here by pilots to Transport Canada and to the management at Orange, yet here we are, uh, we've had this operation uh, operating for an entire year. Now management says, well, we'll take these people out of, uh, out of operation. We'll suspend them. We'll take them. Uh, we'll park them. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'd like to, I have to tell you, I have serious concerns, and I think we all do, that we would have an organization that has the responsibility of 24-7 uh, EMS air ambulance operations uh, for our province and here we find a Transport Canada audit uh, that shows very gross nonconformance with either regulations or the operational man uh, manuals. I'd like to examine some of the specific findings of that Transport Canada report, and I'd like to get your assessment of the severity uh, of, of, these, uh, of these findings. And I'll read into the record the first one. 75, and I'll quote uh, for the record, 7506406 Canada Inc. was conducting a level D training program utilizing a Sikorsky SK-76B type full flight simulator. The SK-76B type helicopter has differences in performance, systems, cockpit layout, and configuration compared to the air operator Sikorsky SK-76A model helicopters. After completion of the full flight simulator, 
SK-76B training program, flight crews assigned to the SK-76A aircraft had received no additional training on the differences between the SK-76B simulator and the SK-76A model, end of quote. That report, <clears throat> the findings report, goes on to say, and I quote, interviews with flight crew, the 7506-406 Canada management team and document reviews confirmed that none of the SK-76A type endorsed flight crews had received differences training, end of quote. Now, Mr. Walji, I'm not a pilot, and I don't profess to know a whole lot about uh, aircraft or uh, what it takes to fly an aircraft. Is this as obvious as it appears? that flight crew were given simulator training in one model of aircraft. They were asked to fly in a different model of aircraft where the, the Transport Canada report actually states that the performance is different, the systems are different, the cockpit layout is different, the configurations are different compared between the two and yet they were given simulator training in one aircraft and expected to fly in another. Is that as obvious as it appears to me? Okay, I, I'd like to explain our process again because uh, on, on, when we do inspection, whether it's a PVR or an assessment, Transport Canada's role is to identify non-conformances and like we said, we do a systems-based approach into the organization to see whether the system is functioning or not. And the way we convey the results of our inspection to the enterprise is through a finding form to identify to the company where corrections need to be made. Our role is not to speculate or look at the, uh, the uh, corrective actions for an organization. So when a finding has been uh, generated and given to the company, the company takes two steps. Number one, they do a short-term corrective fix to bring them back into compliance. <coughs> And then the second step they do is a long-term corrective action to ensure that the non-conformance identified does not recur again. So the onus is on to the enterprise to rectify the non-conformances that have been identified by Transport Canada. Our desire on when we issue a PVA report is to work with the enterprise in an escalation process, what that means is that our desire is that where a company is willing and able to make corrections of its own, implement the corrective actions, and ensure that those non-conformances don't recur, we work at that level of a corrective action plan. So the company will submit to us a corrective action plan to say this is what we did in the short term, this is our analysis of the finding, our root cause, and this is how we are going to be fixing it in the long term so that it does not recur. And we go back and do a follow-up on the enterprise to make sure that the long-term corrective action is effective in fixing those non-conformances. And then we close off the PVA report. Okay, Mr. Walji, so let me ask you this. Um, whose responsibility within the Orange organization would it have been to ensure that the appropriate training programs were in place? Who is that what is the position uh, within the Orange organization that had the responsibility to ensure that these programs were in place? The ops, the ops manager. Yeah, the ops manager. The operations manager. The operations manager. Yes. And, and who at uh, Orange uh, is that? Um, at the time, I don't know. I, yeah. I don't have any... You don't know? I, I'm, I'm I'm not 100% sure. Okay, we well, we, we, we can get back to you. Which you wish. Yeah. The fact is that someone wasn't doing their job at Orange, and uh, what's concerning for us uh, is that given the track record uh, of this organization, um, I, 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 quite frankly, I'm not surprised. And the reason that we're not surprised, that I'm not surprised here, is that I highly question and have to question how this organization was given its initial operating certificate when it went into business. 
because here was an organization, to your point, uh, that you made uh, in your opening statement, and an explanation of what, what of the role that Transport Canada has, and in terms of the, uh, the, the measurement, the risk profile. Here is an organization that has never been in the, in the business uh, of operating a helicopter or a 24-7 aviation business before. Overnight they were in the business. On, on what basis uh, could these people then be qualified, quite frankly, is our initial question. But I want to move on to, the, to another finding that uh, is equally as disturbing as the one that we just dealt with. And again... You have about three minutes, depending on how you want to Okay, well, I'll, I'll quickly deal with this, and if you wouldn't mind, I'll take an extra five minutes of my first 20. Because yep. I'd like to deal with this. Again, it deals with the training issue. The following are examples of flight crew, I'm quoting from uh, the actual report, quote, the following are examples of flight crews who had not received required training. Flight crews are identified by their pilot license numbers. Now, it goes through one, two, three, four, five, six. The last one, number six, gives me particularly great concern, and it reads as follows, quote, controlled flight into terrain avoidance, and it lists one, two, three, for pilots. You know, there was a May 31st crash of an orange helicopter. There's lots of speculation. We won't speculate in terms of what uh, the causes were for that. But one of the things that I've heard from pilots, from frontline people at Orange, is that there was great concern about the lack of training, and even though uh, there were experienced pilots. Uh, what I'm told uh, is that there was very little up training that was taking place within the organization. This finding is particularly concerning. Again, we have to keep in mind, Orange now has been operating for more than a year. And to have this kind of gap in training for pilots the question, this is not Dr. Mazza now. This is after the transition of management took place. This is after the new executives were put in place. This is after we have a new operations manager, a new accountable executive in place, and we have the findings of Transport Canada that fundamental training for pilots had not been put in place. Very disconcerting for us. And... Sir, the, the question, I, I understand your explanation of SMS, and I understand that a system has now been put in place where you're counting on the cooperation of the air operators to actually make this inspection program work. Isn't that correct? No, what we are saying is that the responsibility and accountability to meet regulatory compliance and to remain in to regulatory compliance on an ongoing basis is the responsibility of the enterprise. That's right. And what we have here is clearly an enterprise that either doesn't have the competency, does not understand the implications of not being in compliance, and is putting people at risk. And my question to you as Transport Canada, we look to you as the oversight body to ensure compliance. And, and my concern, quite frankly, is whether or not under the current SMS system that we have, if there's far too much reliance on the operators themselves, and if there isn't a gap here that should be filled in by Transport Canada to be much more proactive. Uh, I'll follow up on that uh, in uh, my follow-up questions, but I'd, I, I'd, I'd like your thoughts just very briefly on that principle okay. of the role of Transport Canada. I know it was a government decision to basically bring in much more uh, responsibility on the part of the operators, but at this point I'm questioning the wisdom of that. Okay, so in, in your uh, uh, speak just now you had really two questions that I, I see from you. One was how did we approve 756, 7506406 Canada Inc. in the first place? Yes. And the SMS question. So I'll start off with how did we approve it? 
the regulations under an air operator says the, the minister shall issue an or operator certificate when an enterprise meets certain conditions. Okay? So the obligation is on the minister to issue the certificate when somebody demonstrates to us they have the capability and they meet the regulatory requirements. So, so I'm sorry to interrupt, but this is very important. So are you telling me that at the time that you issued the certificate, all of these issues, they were in compliance exactly. at that time? Exactly. And because so from the time yes. that they went into business, yes. under the current orange management, they went out of compliance, that somehow they had these training programs exactly. in place, and within a 12-month period, everything went into the basket. Yes. Is that what you're saying? What we are saying is that at the time of issuance of the certificate, they met the requirements, which said that we ensure that they have a training program in place, they have a qualified crew, they have a maintenance requirements for their aircraft, they have a maintenance control system for their maintenance requirements. They met all those requirements, and that's when we issue them a certificate to say, yes, you do meet the minimum requirements. Okay, so one other question, uh, if I might. Uh, I there was a transition from Canadian helicopters to Orange management, to Orange. When you did your initial assessment, had the transition from Canadian helicopters to Orange taken place? Or were you, were you basing your certification on the expertise, the training programs, and all that involved the operations? Were you basing that on the then uh, Canadian helicopters uh, management? No. So what happens is whenever an enterprise comes to us and applies for a certificate, an operating certificate, they have to present to us their manuals, their training program. Everything has to be under the control of the air operator. In this case, it's 7506406 Canada Inc. So it has got nothing to do with Canadian helicopters. This enterprise has to present to us how they're going to be running their business, how are they going to be training their crew, how are they going to be maintaining their aircraft, and then we issue them the certificate. So it is looking at that one particular company. So how, how, would, how would Orange have developed those manuals uh, within uh, the, the very limited space of time? Isn't it reasonable to, to assume that what they did was transfer or deliver to you or show you the manuals that were in fact uh, Canadian helicopters uh, uh, manuals put their name on it without having the competency to actually deliver under those uh, under those standards. Is that a possibility? That would be speculation on my part, sir. And uh, we approve a manual which is presented to us by the enterprise, signed off by the accountable executive. So that is what we get in our offices, and this is what our inspectors work with. And within 12 months, the accountable executive got a letter uh, from Transport Canada saying you are out of compliance uh, with very critical aspects of the operations. Yes, and that's, a, that's the reason why we do inspections to ensure that the company maintains regulatory compliance, right? So, and when we talk about the risk profile, I mentioned to you that it, because it's a new operation, we don't know a lot of, about it, how it is going to be functioning. So we go in there within a year to see what is the health of the company. And when we do find non conformances we do identify them. And then the onus is on the enterprise to, to rectify them. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Cleese used about 25 minutes, so we'll start with that for, uh, for the NDP. Mr. Singh? Sure. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you and good morning. Thank good you for being here today. So just want to touch on some of the points that you just raised about uh, You'd indicated that there's a minimum standard that a company or enterprise has to achieve before they receive a certification. Is, is that correct? Correct. Uh, are there different levels? Uh, that's the minimum standard. But if a company has, you know, surpassed the minimum standards, do you assign a certain level to that? That this company is, you know, in an excellent condition, or their their uh, their manuals and their safety protocols and their uh, the inspection that we've done, we've assessed them at a higher or lower, or do you just have a minimum that they need to achieve? Okay. Uh, so, sorry, I forgot to answer the second question for Mr. Cleese when he asked about SMS. I just want to clarify that uh, 7506406 Canada Inc. does not come under the SMS regulations because it is not uh, under a Part 5 operation. So SMS rules do not apply to Orange at this particular time. Sure. 
Okay, so no problem. So going back to your question, yes. so when I say minimum requirements is in order to be issued a certificate of operation, the company when they present to us, we ensure that they meet the minimum requirements, which says you must have a flight crew who is trained, you have a maintenance program in place, okay? And then as the company matures and it starts working with its systems and processes in place, it might start using best practices from industry and do a little bit more than what the minimum requirements are. And, and when we do our risk profiling that I talked about, we talked about the impact statement and this is where we take into consideration. Does the company have an SMS? Does the company have safety intelligence other than what is normally being presented? Are they using that safety intelligence in the right manner to improve their operation? And then we give them a, a scoring which changes the schedule. So maybe if they have all these best practices, they might go to a five-year period instead of a one-year period or a two-year ah, period. I see. I see. So that's how we w use this intelligence to set up our uh, program schedule. When do we go and do an inspection on this company? Okay. And so just to give a range, uh, if a company is just meeting the minimum requirements, that means the, the risk profile that's generated would require a yearly inspection? Not necessarily. It all depends upon the change of the company. Like I said, the risk profile is sets up a baseline. And then as the company is undergoing change, so let's say they add more aircraft, maybe they add extra sub-bases, maybe they start doing an international operation, so then it changes the state of that organization. And then it will change the risk number, and then depending upon where it sits in the risk matrix is whether we would go in there at a one-year period or a two-year period. Okay, and so what is the minimum uh, timeline that you'll, that you'll go back into a company? Uh, I'm assuming it's a one it's a one year period. Could it be less than that, six months? Yes. So very good question. So in my opening I explained to you there is planned surveillance and unplanned surveillance. Okay? So planned surveillance is we have over in Ontario approximately let's say for just for illustration purposes, three hundred enterprises. So when we do our surveillance planning over the five-year period, we look at these 300 enterprises and say, where do they fit in this matrix to work out when we're going to pay them a visit for our inspection purposes? So the planned surveillance is between one and five years. Now, in your question, you said, can we go sh sooner? Sure, we can. When we get any intelligence that there is something going on with this enterprise or we see some incidents occur, we go into what we call the unplanned surveillance. And then we can go in there and do an inspection uh, based upon what we have uh, uncovered. So yes, it can be under one year period, absolutely. Okay, and you talked about intelligence or incidents. So an incident would be, I'm assuming, if there was a serious crash or some sort of uh, accident that occurred, that would be considered an incident and that would prompt perhaps uh, another inspection? Sure, like it could be a, like a hard landing or any other incident besides a crash. It okay. could be any kind of incident. Also, we get uh, the Civil Aviation Daily Occurrence Reports, CADORs, and these are also good triggers for us. So if there is a CADOR that has been raised that we feel requires our intervention and we want to go and inspect the company based upon the, uh, the CADOR, we can go in there and look at that. So these are the triggers that will make us go in there sooner than the planned surveillance cycle. And a CADOR is uh, it's like a daily report that you receive? Correct. And maybe you can expand on what the CADOR is. Yeah, and what does it stand for? Daily Occurrence Report. Uh, Sorry? There is, it stands for Civil Aviation's uh, Daily Occurrence Reports. And then these are uh, any incident that, trans that uh, NAV Canada, which is the, the controlling Excuse agency. me. Can you speak a little bit into the microphone? Or, or not too close, but just for the benefit of Hansu, please. Thank you. Okay. And uh, there's various categories. Uh, some are relatively minor, and then others uh, require us to follow up on, on the incident. And then that's when we contact the company, and then we look at the uh, at the process that could have been involved in the incident itself, okay? And then we look at uh, what is the company, uh, the, you know, the, the investigation that they carried out, the issues that they've identified, whatever it is, you know, that they need to correct to make sure that it doesn't reoccur. And okay. that's basically, and then we follow up on that and we keep track. And these things also are looked again, those incidents are looked again when we do PVIs 
and then also they may impact on the uh, risk profile of the company if for example something reoccurs then, I see. Know, so, the, so uh, the Cadors can impact the uh, risk assessment and um, based on that you might be more likely to have a, uh, an earlier visit or an unplanned visit. Absolutely. Okay. And then the intelligence you were talking about, the intelligence, is that something that uh, you receive a complaint from someone saying that there's a problem here at this base or a problem with this enterprise? What, what is the intelligence? It, it, it can be. Uh, many times we, we, we have our uh, civil aviation issues reporting system, CARES, which is a confidential system where uh, people can go into there and they can be anonymous and they can identify some issues with any companies or personnel. And then we are bound to do some kind of a review on that care to see is it valid? Is there any substance behind what has been uh, reported in there? And we do investigate that. So what was the name of this anonymous line again? It's, it's a Civil Aviation Issues Reporting System, CARES. It's an online system. Civilian, uh, Civil avi Aviation. Civilian Aviation. Issues, issues Reporting System. Reporting System. Okay. That's good. Um, and this is a, is this a number that anyone, for example, any civilian or anyone who works in the company, anyone can use that? Anybody is open to the public, they can file a report in there. Okay. And it's completely anonymous? You can be anonymous or if you want a response, you can say, I would like a response and you can give your information. Mm -hmm. And then once we have uh, looked into what the issue was, then we would provide a response to the person to say, okay, this is the results of what we did. Okay. Now, uh, my other concern is... Is there a relationship between what you do in Transport Canada, I mean, you're providing oversight for aviation, uh, which is an, a very important responsibility and I, and I appreciate that you're doing that. Is there a relationship between uh, Transport Canada, which is a federal entity, and is there any reporting obligation to the provincial government? Because there's an overlap, this is a provincial entity that's providing a provincial service, but because they're aviation, there's a federal jurisdiction. Is there any sort of reporting requirement between the federal government and the provincial government, or does the provincial government have any access to uh, these, uh, whether it's the, the risk assessment or the compliance? Uh, is there any sort of interplay between the two? I um, don't believe no, so. No, no, there isn't. Okay, yeah. the uh, the safety of operations is a, is 100% a responsibility responsibility the federal government. Uh, and then we make sure that uh, what we approve and then through our surveillance program uh, confirms that the company continues to be compliant. Uh, just a little bit of clarification on the, uh, the, the, the statement that the, uh, uh, the regulations are in place and we say minimum requirement. Uh, that minimum requirement is based on historical performance, i.e., you know, like, I mean, we could go for the Cadillac, which is, would be just uh, out of this world. However, we put in uh, a floor as to where an operation needs to be in order to be safe. And that's how we define the, the regulatory requirement, the standards, for example, and that's how these are established. And, you know, it's not unique to Canada. It's, it's worldwide. ICAO. Uh, the International Aviation uh, Organization, you know, sets those limits. Okay. And, uh, you know, like it's, uh, some people may be nervous about, you know, minimum requirement. You know, it is actually, uh, at minimum, we believe that it is a safe operation. Historically, it has been. If you comply at the minimum requirement, you're safe. Okay. That's good to know. So the minimums are not, you know, the bare bones. They're, they're a quite not. strong standard. That's Absolutely good to know. Not. Um, I want you to, if you're able to, and if you can't, just please let me know. Uh, before uh, Ontario had orange, there was the Ontario Air Ambulance. Uh, are you familiar with uh, the Ontario Air, Air Ambulance and what their compliance was with respect to uh, Transport Canada and whether there was any compliance issues? I'm sorry, I'm, I, I don't understand your question. Sorry, so we we're speaking of uh, the compliance issues uh, January 9th and January 20th, uh, between January 9th and January 24th, you conducted a PVI on Orange specifically, mm -hmm. and you identified some issues with Orange before that Orange had received a, a certificate of, you know, that it, w it met the standards. Uh, subsequently, when you did a PVI, that you had identified some areas of concern regarding training and regarding um, uh, record keeping and various other issues. 
previous to the existence of Orange, uh, which is an entity that, that provides, you know, uh, ambulance service in, in Ontario, previous to Orange, there was an entity that doing the same service, providing the same service. It was known as Ontario Air Ambulance. Are you familiar with that organization and what their compliance was? No, we, we, we approve uh, air operators on an individual basis, right? So when an enterprise comes to us and they want an air operating certificate, we look at it as an entity or as a standalone. The service they provide is whatever they – is it passenger carrying, is it air ambulance, is it aerial work? Their operation is subsidiary. As long as they meet our regulatory requirements to be issued with a certificate, we will issue them a certificate. Right, right. I understand. I think it's, it's difficult. I'm trying to ask you a question about um, what – I guess another – another entity that existed before Orange and, and if you had any records in terms of uh, their compliance and how, what standard they were achieving and whether there were compliance issues like the, you know, training issues or uh, record keeping issues in that previous entity, but I don't think you have that yeah. information before you. No. I just, that's fine. Um, now moving forward, what type of relationship do you have uh, with, with Orange? Where does it sit in the risk matrix? And what is your uh, anticipation for future, I guess, PBIs or inspections, planned or unplanned? What's your expectation? So, so at this present time, Orange is putting its long-term corrective action plan into place. And what we will be doing is we will be conducting follow-up to make sure that the long-term corrective action that Orange has provided to us is being implemented and is being effective. And then when we do this follow-up inspection, we will see and go and update our risk profile to see where it comes up in. So any time there is any change in an organization is when we go in there and update our system. Because like I said, that system is based upon measuring change, you know, and how is the company coping with the change. Okay. And, and given the fact that there was these, your, your PBI came back with, came back with uh, non-compliance or issues around those those topics we've discussed. That's I I'm, I'm assuming that that's resulted in a, a risk assessment that's lower now, right? or I don't know actually how you're. But it's there's more risk associated, so it's it's going to be uh, a target versus another company that had no compliance issues, which be maybe less of an issue, and they might have a longer duration in between their inspections. Yes. Is that a fair? Yeah. Yeah. Is is possible? Like I said, when we go and do our follow-up, we might find that the company has got good systems in place, they have got good robust processes in place, and they're effective. And then when our inspectors go back and update our questionnaire, you know, we'll see where they fall into the risk matrix. Now, at this point in time, you indicated that they're putting together a long-term plan, um, and, and you'll assess that once that long-term plan is put together. It's not been... Uh, presented to you yet, I'm assuming. Is that correct? No, the, the, the long-term plan has been presented to us because we have accepted the cultivation plan. They are now in the process of implementing it. So we would like to give them some time to implement it to make sure it is effective before we go in and check it because there's no point looking at it right away because they haven't had a chance to work at it. So we want to allow them to work at their plan and then we go in there and inspect to make sure that it is effective. Now, with the corrective action, uh, what was a corrective action, if you could just outline that again, and and how satisfied are you with that corrective action at this point, the immediate I, corrective action? Well, the immediate corrective action is like uh, Mr. Frank please talked about from the report is the company said we are not going to be allowing a price to fly unless they get the training. So that was their immediate short-term fix. And then the long term is they're putting a system in place to make sure that this issue does not recur again. So they presented that with us with a corrective action plan to say what systems they're going to be changing and how they're going to be implementing it and the timelines <coughs> under which they will implement it. And we accepted their plan. And now we will go back and we are in the process of evaluating some of the long-term corrective actions. Now, if you were able to compare just on a, on a, uh, on a broad level, the approach or the, the way Orange handled or this, the entity that you uh, – the numbered company that you've given, the way they've handled this situation compared to other companies, are you satisfied with the way they handled it or the, the, the manner in which they responded to your concerns? 
So when we look at the approach, we don't compare a company to company. We look at an enterprise. How did this enterprise deal with it? Are they willing and able to deal with the situation? And, and are they implementing the corrective actions? So we look at it as an individual basis. And, and when we go and inspect, we'll say, okay, you told us that you're going to implement a certain action. Did you implement it? Is it effective? Okay. Um, did you get uh, any heads up or any intelligence prior to your PBI that there were pilots and staff that were concerned about the safety of the night flights um, or the safety of the flying in general at Orange prior to your PBI? I am not aware of that. I can look into your records and get back to you, but at this time I'm sorry I don't have that in information. Sure, and I noticed, Mr. Lemieux, you were also sh shaking your head in the negative that you, you weren't aware of any intelligence prior. Mm -hmm. No, no. No, okay. Uh, so beyond the, the, the PVI and beyond the now uh, anticipated long-term strategy that will be presented to you in more detail, is there, are there any day-to-day -day interactions between yourself and Orange? I guess there's the, the CARES reports that you receive. Are there, is there, or do you receive those daily? No, I give an example of intelligence because you asked me the question, what are the type of intelligence ah, we see, can get? And CARES is one methodology I under see. which we get intelligence. I see. And, so. and we interact with, uh, with the company on a regular basis because we are doing follow-up actions with the company. And, uh, you know, they submit a manual for amendment because as they are implementing the corrective action plan, they are changing the processes and procedures. So they submit amendments to their manuals for our approval. Okay, so at this time, uh, what it, what, can you describe the, the regular action, interaction between yourself and Orange, and who is it that you're interacting with? So the, uh, we have principal inspectors uh, who are responsible for Orange. So we have a flight operations inspector who looks after the flight operations aspects of the organization, and we have an airworthiness inspector who looks after all the maintenance requirements of the company. So between the two of them, they manage the day-to-day -day operations of the company. And so they are uh, interacting directly with the key personnel. So for example, the airworthiness inspector would be interacting with the person responsible for the maintenance control system mm -hmm. and at, the, Orange. At, at Orange. Mm -hmm. And the flight ops inspector would be interacting with the chief pilot and the ops manager. Okay. And in terms of a schedule or how regular that is, uh, it would be the inspectors themselves that would be able to give that information about how often or how regularly their interactions are. Correct. It, it depends upon the submissions from the company, uh, how often they make them, uh, what are their queries, what information they're looking for. It will depend on that. Okay. And just a quick moment's indulgence. Uh, how much time do I have left? <coughs> you have uh, six minutes. Six minutes. Okay. I'll, I'll take it on the next. Okay. Very good. Yeah. And we'll move to the government. Mr. Morrow. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Gentlemen, good morning. Uh, nice. Thank you for being here today. We appreciate uh, your attendance. I, I noted in your opening remarks that um, you both, uh, the two of you, share responsibility for Ontario. One is east, one is west. So at least one of you has some familiarity with, with Thunder Bay, I'm sure. Uh, that's my riding. And... Uh, this issue of air ambulance services, of course, in Northern Ontario is extremely top of mind for people, certainly in my neck of the woods, but obviously for the entire province. Um, which of you is it that has the Western? That would be you. Yeah. Okay. I've got a series of questions. I wanted to uh, first ask again about the frequency of your visits. I heard you, you gave a response earlier. But I also want you to let me know if any of your visits are unannounced or if they are all scheduled. Okay, so we, we have two methodologies of surveillance. We talked about planned and unplanned. Okay. So our unannounced visits are unplanned activities, which would be driven by a trigger. Uh, it could be from a CADOR, which is a Civil Elevation Daily Occurrence Report. Or it could be some intelligence that somebody has given us saying, you know, there is some issues with this operator. You know, we want to have transport look at it. We, would, we can do that. 
but no normally is uh, out of courtesy we would call the operator say you know we are coming in today to look at your records so that you know they can prepare the records for us okay so so the frequency of visits some somebody asked you earlier about frequency and I'm thinking it was one to four three years one to five, five years that's a planned surveillance that's that's kind of where I'm going yes. so that on the frequency when you responded <coughs> to that question those were planned visits yes but the unannounced visits that can be triggered by uh, reasons that you've just explained to us would be in addition yes okay correct um, and those could be anywhere from none to exactly. a number exactly. yeah, depending on the quality of the carrier or exactly. information that you gather correct through a variety of means what, what are some of the ways that you would receive information that would trigger an unannounced visit uh, we, we, we get quite a few through our civil aviation issues reporting system uh, other way is you know a person might call one of the principal inspectors or maybe one of our technical team leads who is the supervisor of a particular transport Canada center so for example Thunder Bay or somebody might call our issues managers or they might put in a com request from headquarters mm -hmm. so there are multiple ways where information can be given right. to transport canada so do you have any sense of uh, how many unannounced visits were made to to orange and its bases no i don't have that no okay. um, i want to just step back a little bit before uh, going forward with the questions um, to the beginning of orange so you identified in your opening remarks three companies I think is what you one fixed wing one maintenance or refurbishment and then the third one the rotary um, so to be clear before orange began their operation from Transport Canada's perspective all three of those different business lines were in compliance according to Transport Canada correct the three companies that we talked about sorry the three companies that we talked right. about yes yeah and so they were all inspected uh, that's normal course of procedure correct um, when when a new operation is starting you show up mm -hmm. you inspect you do your work they don't get to go lift off the ground before no. you've been there correct and that happened with all three of those business lines so once orange took over from CHC this occurred Transport Canada was there on all three business lines, inspected them, and you have records that would prove and indicate you were there, inspections occurred, everything was fine. Yeah. So, so f just for clarity, the yeah. Orange Global Air Inc., which was a fixed wing, was approved in 2009. Okay. And then the approved maintenance organization under Global uh, Air Inc., Orange Global Air Inc., which was the Orange Global Technical Services is the trade name is yeah. was approved in 2011 August of 2011 and then the 750646 Canada Inc was approved in January of 2012 so when did orange begin its operations those well, those companies you just described those are what you see as their start dates yes okay there, there were a series of questions asked by uh, by the other members that um, I thought were were good questions that uh, made me pause and consider uh, a couple of things. So, when you uh, through Transport Canada go in and do your PVI or what other other whatever other uh, methods of inspection and to confirm compliance when you go in and you you identify shortcomings uh, first of all your processes are the same for all carriers all kinds of carriers there's no distinction between an air ambulance and a commercial no. carrier a charter carrier everybody's treated the same your PVIs whatever it is you do everybody's treated the same the inspection methodology is the same for everybody okay and the inspection methodology is the same for all carriers in Ontario and it's the same for all carriers in the rest of Canada we, we have a policy document uh, st our staff instruction SUR-001 right. uh, we are under issue 5 right now yeah. and all uh, Transport Canada civil aviation inspectors conducting surveillance activities 
how to do it by that policy document. And so that policy document applies across the country? Correct. Okay. The questions that were asked that uh, indicated, and I suppose it's not unusual, although concerning for all of us, that you're occasionally and from time to time going to find carriers non-compliant for some of their responsibilities. Your response was a little concerning for me because, and I think probably for all of us, but that's why I asked you the first questions about everybody's treated the same. Indicated that when you find through your work areas of non-compliance, it, it sounds like it goes to an area of some sort of self-regulation where internally the operator, the enterprise, in this case Orange, has the capacity, the responsibility to continue operating while they are addressing the shortcomings identified by your investigation. Have I got that accurate? Uh, yes, and, and so again to clarify, when we talk about a company responding to our findings, we talked about yeah. a short-term fix and a long-term fix, which right. is expected. So in this particular instance where they voluntarily grounded their crew to make sure that they did not fly the next flight is the action that the company took. Yeah. So they mitigated the risk right away. Yeah. The long-term fix is they're going to put a process in place to ensure yeah. that that does not recur again. Mm -hmm. And that is what we are interested in to see. Is that long-term fix effective? Is it working so that this issue does not recur again? So I want to look back to my, one of my first questions. So when you have identified some non-compliance for whatever reasons, um, and then this other piece kicks in where the operator, the enterprise, has the responsibility to fix, does it trigger the frequency or the unannounced visits from you uh, more than normally would be the case? Once you've been there once and you've identified some concerns, what's your, so, and, and everybody's the same, they, they self-regulate to some degree, I'm not sure that's the best language no, for me not. to use, but it's probably not, but they have to come into compliance exactly. based upon your findings, uh, and they have responsibility to do that. What does Transport Canada do once you've identified them? Does your frequency of inspection stay the same? Will, are you more likely to visit that carrier more frequently on an unannounced basis, on an announced basis? What, what happens once you've identified? So it all depends upon, like we said, we, said, we talked about the company's willingness and ability to come up with a corrective action plan to ensure compliance, right? So when we get their long-term timetable, which says that, you know, at this time frame, we will be implementing uh, certain processes, procedures, we would go in there to make sure that they are on track with their timeline. And, and then once they have implemented it fully, we would go back again and ensure that the full process is effective. So it is not that we leave them hands off. We do ensure that we are monitoring their timeline for compliance to the long-term fix. And then we would go back in there again and update our risk profiling and see where does it fall in the matrix. Does it increase the frequency? Does it shorten the frequency? Anything else you want to add? No, it's one thing, you know, when we, uh, when a non-compliance has been identified uh, and then they come up with a plan to correct it, first of all, I, ha I want to, uh, to emphasize again that if, for example, there's a lack, uh, a deficiency in the training of a pilot, of a maintenance person, and that this is fixed, it has to be fixed immediately. Like the pilot cannot go flying until that's fixed. Okay, so when the pilot goes flying, they are compliant. During the okay. implementation of corrective action plan, we will go on and on and then follow up and then ensure that in fact it is progressing at the rate because the corrective action plan also has a target date. Yeah. And we will go at whatever you know, uh, frequency that we feel necessary that the PIs, the principal inspectors uh, feel necessary to ensure that they are on track, that they are following up what they are saying that they were going to do. Mm -hmm. And then you know, uh, 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 monitor whether it is effective and then ultimately at the end of the period, you know, we have a look at the whole <coughs> system that they have in place now to ensure that this issue, this original issue, will not occur again. 
So and, that, and basically that closes it. So now once it, not, sorry, yeah, finish. Now, if, if we have concern for whatever reason, okay, when we go into the, uh, the database and then we, we, we put that as, uh, we basically put a flag on this item and then it may or may not uh, uh, impact on the, on the score, on the profile, on the risk profile of the company. Again, it depends on the, on the item. You know, if, it's, if it was an administrative, i.e. records, training records were not being maintained properly, mm -hmm. yeah. We're satisfied that the training took place. However, yeah. Yeah. the training record was out of date. Well, this is a non-compliance. Right. But from a safety point of view, right. there's not. Well, thank you. That, you've gone to sort of the heart of where I, <clears throat> I wanted to follow up. So when you've identified non-compliance, you, you are paying more attention to that particular enterprise. Oh, absolutely. And there is obviously a degree of importance uh, and I'm being careful with my language here because, again, as a non-professional, I'm not in any way wanting to convey that we understate the importance of this work, but there are factors that might be non-compliant that, of course, would cause Transport Canada less concern than others. And as you said uh, in your response, that if a pilot <coughs> was identified as not having, as an example, appropriate level of training, that's not something that they would be able to... Uh, that, I mean, that shuts down immediately, yes. this person. That's now, have you ever had that experience uh, with Orange? Well, the report yep. that Mr. Cleese just read out yep. and the examples yep. shows that. So the yep. company voluntarily stopped their crew yep. from flying yep. till they made sure they were trained, and then they were releasing them as they got trained. So how did we get to that point? How did they get to that point? That... <laughs> Yeah, so we'll have that opportunity this afternoon. Yeah. Transport Canada, um, I mean, you have the authority uh, to ground civil, civil aviation operations, correct? Correct. So can you give me a sense of uh, some of the circumstances that would lead to you <coughs> grounding a carrier? So, you know, I described to you that uh, when we do a program validation inspection, our desired uh, response is to start with a corrective action plan. That is the first step where the company is willing and able to comply. Now, if the company is not willing and able and they are not really uh, responding appropriately or correcting their uh, non-conformances, yeah. we have the option of going enforcement where we can uh, levy uh, a, a fine through our designated provisions. And then the next step also we can do is also uh, issue a notice of suspension. And a notice of suspension would have a trigger date which says that you must fix or you must comply and do certain actions for us to terminate the notice before it kicks in. So if an enterprise does not meet the conditions for the termination of the notice of suspension, the notice of suspension would come into effect and then the carrier will be grounded. So we do have the tools to use depending upon the severity and the situation at hand. Has Orange ever been grounded? We have not issued a notice of suspension that I'm aware of to Orange. When, when they effectively grounded themselves yeah. uh, until all the pilots were, like I believe uh, there was a statement that yeah. uh, okay. read that they actually had uh, st stop operations at various sites, for example. So that was voluntary on the part okay. of the company, again, until everything was in place and back into compliance. Okay. Um, they're flying today. When's the last time your operations have uh, inspected Orange? We have, uh, we did a program, well, no, we did a process inspection back in June of this year, and uh, the inspectors have been uh, following up on the corrective action plan of the report that was done for the January program validation inspection. So they are in constant touch with uh, Orange and conducting inspections as they're progressing through their uh, fixes for the long-term corrective action. So you, you have each been doing this work with Transport Canada for some time? 
Sorry, five ourselves? years, ten years, twenty uh, years. I've been with Transport for seventeen years. Seventeen. Long. 25. Longer than that. <laughs> Twenty-five years. I'm just trying to get a sense of, um, uh, through your experience of uh, of doing the work that you do, um, how you would compare, if you can, for me, uh, this operator with previous operators. Uh, in terms of non-compliance. Um, I don't know if you're able to do that. I, I would think you might be able to give us some indication of, um, I'm not looking for you to tell me one's better than the other, but I suppose it's not unusual to find areas of non-compliance with any carrier. I would expect, uh, can, can you give me some sense of, of that historically to the, the sort of, I guess I'm saying pre-orange, post-orange? Well, it's, it's very difficult to compare operation to operation because each operation is unique in how they run their operation and the processes and systems they use for their particular operation. Our interest is to ensure that is the company compliant with the regulations or not when we do the inspections. Mm -hmm. And if a company is in regulatory compliance, then their operating certificate is still valid. When a company is uh, suspended where due to, you know, a lot of uh, non-compliances, then we would suspend the certificate. But as long as the company has a valid operating certificate, they are in compliance with the regulations. Yeah. How much time do I have, Mr. Chair? Seven minutes. I'm going to leave a little bit of time, but I will ask one more question. Um, I just want to go circle back to uh, previous questions. So in terms of, uh, if you can just sort of give me a bit of a timeline. Once you have identified non-compliance and those items of course have varying degrees of importance. Can you, can you give me a sense of Transport Canada's timeline um, associated with your follow-up once you've been on site and identified th those areas of non-compliance? So, so when a company has got uh, major non-compliances non identified our expectation is that their corrective action plan is going to be more robust, is going to be more detailed than an administrative for example, for missing training records. So because the uh, corrective action plan is going to be more detailed, our follow-up would be matching the same way because we want to make sure that those major non-compliances are addressed in an appropriate manner, and so we, our follow-up would be more uh, stringent, would be more hands-on, we would be paying a lot more attention to those specific findings than the administrative type of findings. Mm -hmm. So my last question for now would be, would be this. If, if you found yourselves at Transport Canada as uh, uh, visiting a base and found non-compliant issues serious enough that you felt Transport Canada needed to ground the carrier and given that the carrier is providing air ambulance services in Ontario, what if anything would you do to ensure, what's, what's the interface between you and the province through the Orange Board to ensure you wouldn't see a gap in services if you showed up and felt you had to shut down a carrier? Our responsibility is with the air operating certificate right. and the carrier by itself. Yeah. Is it in compliance with the regulations yeah. or not? If there are non compliances identified, our first step would be to identify to the company. To, your first step would be to? To identify to the company the non compliances, yes. saying, look, this is what we are seeing. How are you going to deal with this non compliances? Yeah. Right. And, and depending upon the response we get, would be whether we take further action or not. And so I'm asking, I guess I'm asking you if you did take further action and if that action was to ground the carrier, in this case a carrier that's responsible for the provision of air ambulance, there, there would clearly be a service gap here for the people that are counting on that service. So I'm trying to get a sense of what your role is, <coughs> if, if there is one, to ensure that the province has some, uh, I mean, I, I, I'm just trying. 
There's, there's no. Oh, we, we deal with an aeroporter certificate. Understood. That's where I thought you were going. So to be clear, if you if you show up tomorrow to a base that does this work, you shut them down. That's it. Uh, the province would be left to scramble to ensure that they could. Would you would you make a phone call? Would you send a fax? Would you I'd, would you let the orange board know? No communication at all. You just say you're you're non-compliant. You're done. Well, so let me little explain to you about our notice of suspensions and how they work. Okay, so. So we, we have two methodologies for our notice of suspension. One is an immediate threat to aviation safety, <coughs> which is an immediate thing. So, for example, that would be a situation, let's say they have, uh, they're ready to dispatch an aircraft, any air operator, and let's say they got uh, icing on the wing. You know, that is an immediate threat. So we say, <coughs> you, you, you have your suspension until you clean up the ice <coughs> of your wings, you are suspended because the company wasn't doing it willingly, right? The second notice of suspension that we issue is, which has got a time trigger on it, which is based upon three elements of the Aeronautics Act, right? So under the Act, it'll be, it is uh, for reasons of incompetence. Uh, the company does not meet conditions of issuance of the certificate that we issued back to them back in 2012, you know, or the, in the public interest this company does not, cannot operate. So these are the three conditions under which we can issue a notice of suspension. When we do the notice of suspension under this part of the Aeronautics Act, we have a trigger date which says, here is a notice, we are going to give you a time frame of, you know, depending upon the severity, 30 days, 15 days, to meet the conditions for the termination mm -hmm. of the notice. So the carrier, or the operating certi or an AMO is not grounded at the particular time, they have that time period to meet the conditions uh -huh. to terminate the notice. Understood. When they don't meet that, that's when the notice takes effect. So perhaps it'll be for me a better question this afternoon for Mr. McCallum to see what processes that Orange has in place for them uh, specifically as well as for their SA carriers to ensure that if something like this was to occur, there's a plan in place that's going to meet the gap that would be created by a grounding. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you very much. How much thank time did we have left? Thank you very much. Uh, you'll have about 11 minutes in your next round. Thank you, and we'll go to Mr. Cleese. You have 10 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Walji. Um, <clears throat> I appreciate uh, the information that you're uh, providing to us. I do have one concern, though. I, I'm getting conflicting information, and, uh, you know, we're not here to whitewash things, right? So I've heard you repeatedly say that the shutdown uh, of these bases uh, based on <clears throat> your uh, report when it was found that uh, there was the gap in training of the pilots you re repeatedly used the term that they voluntarily suspended operations Mr. Lemieux confirmed in response to Mr. Morrow's questions that if in fact there was a problem with the training of pilots then they wouldn't be allowed to fly. Which of you is telling us the factual truth here? No, what, what Mr. Lemieux is saying is the same thing, is that once the company identifies that the, the pilots are not trained, they themselves voluntarily stop them from flying. No, 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 no. I, I'm, I'm, asking, I'm asking a question. Seriously, I don't want to be spun here on this. The fact of the matter is, whether the company decided to suspend operations or not, is it not a case that Transport Canada would not allow that company to lift off. Mr. Lemieux, I'd, I'd ask you to confirm if, in fact, in your inspection reports, you find serious problems, as you did here with Orange, in the training of pilots, that Transport Canada would essentially suspend operations. You wouldn't let them fly. Is that correct or not? That is correct. That is correct. I, so actually, the, the, the grounding or this, the, 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 uh, the alt in operation took place on the day that we uncovered the, you know, didn't, you know they didn't wait for the, the March report to actually act, action. So when the company uh, takes action to meet our satisfaction, okay, we're, you know, basically these pilots will not get in the cockpit until we have completed all training. Right. And we're satisfied with that. And, and it is still on record that we uncovered this non-compliance. It's not, you know, that all of a sudden we say, okay, that's fine, you know, we'll forget about that and that's it. 
Okay. So I thank you for that because it, uh, it was very disconcerting. And, and it's not a matter of Orange voluntarily stopping. It's a matter of Orange having no choice based on the Transport yes. Canada inspection. Absolutely. Yes. So, I, I, you know, uh, this is important. Yes. And the reason I wanted to clarify that is, is that I don't want to leave the impression that somehow uh, there are two concerns I have. One is that Transport Canada is kind of a, a nudger or a suggester uh, of, uh, of safety measures. And somehow that, that Orange is, is so gracious in terms of its response that they voluntarily have suspended. Orange had no choice mm -hmm. because they failed miserably in terms of training its pilots. Transport Canada stepped in and said, you cannot lift off with these pilots until you get your training in place. Is that correct? Yes, correct. correct. Thank you very much. Now, I know, gentlemen, that you can't speak to policy. I, I would like to ask this question, though. When was it that kind of this self-policing policy was put in place under Transport Canada? Do you, do you, can you tell us uh, when uh, that transition to this self-policing, this SMS program took place? There is no self-policing. The requirements for an SMS, again, Orange is not an SMS company. That, that, that is, I un right. that's not my question. So SMS is a methodology for an enterprise to manage risks. When did that, when did that policy get put in place? I believe it came on in 2006 it's or 2005 is when for the 705. 705 carriers and upper maintenance organizations who perform work okay. on them. Orange may not be an SMS carrier. However, under the fixed wing side of the Orange operations, the carriers that Orange contracts with are under SMS. Uh, the rules don't apply to the 704 carriers. Well, yeah, look, we 703. had testimony here last week from Mr. Paul Cox, uh, who is contracted uh, to, um, uh, to Orange as a carrier. Uh, he is clearly under Transport Canada SMS, he, uh, 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 SMS uh, operations. I'm going to just quote you something. And the reason I want to pursue this with you is that I have serious concerns about what's happening under that system. I'm going to read from our Hansard transcripts. When was the last time that you had a Transport Canada audit? His response was two years ago. What were the findings of that audit? I know we had quite a few findings. My question back, can you give me an example of some of those findings? Now I want, I'm going to read this into the record and I, I want you to tell me whether this response concerns you or not. Quote, a lot of it was quality assurance, new stuff that was coming out. The quality assurance SMS, Transport Canada was very vague on whether they were actually ever going to implement SMS and stuff like that, so it was hard to get to know whether you were going to need to do it or not. It's still kind of up in the air. We have SMS, but we don't have SMS as per the other air operator, operators like Air Canada and the big companies. We do it in the same style, but it's not the same. End of quote. Now, here's a, an air carrier, someone who is contracted to provide air ambulance service to Orange. He's telling us that he's under SMS. He's telling us that he gets inspected by Transport Canada, but somehow everything's up in the air. Had lots of findings, not sure whether to take them seriously or not. How do you react to that? Let me speak a little bit about the SMS. So we, we had an SMS transition period when the 705 carriers were approved. And the next phase of SMS implementation was with the airports. So we had the Group 1 airports like the Pearson Airport, Montreal, Vancouver. And then the next phase of SMS implementation was the Group 2 airports. And this is where the implementation period stopped. Transport is reviewing the SMS requirements right now and coming up with a plan as to when the rest of the certificates will require SMS. So in, in your particular example, and I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that this gentleman, Mr. Peter Cox, is of a 704 or a 703 type carrier. It's Mr. Paul Cox, and oh, the name Cox, of the sorry. airline is Wabusk Air, W-A-B-U-S-K. Yeah, so that's probably a 703 <coughs> air operator. SMS rules do not apply to them. Why would Transport Canada then inspect it? 
We can't under do SMS. No, we don't. Uh, okay, uh, there is. Uh, okay, let me. You know, l let me let me just add one more thing okay. to the record, and then I if you could help me, I'm going to pr give you a quote. Uh, this is from a very large air operator in the province of Ontario. Here's what he wrote to me following last week's testimony. Quote, audits, oversight, and surveillance by Transport Canada has been reduced to the point that things are going backwards in the industry. The regulations are being broken and certain carriers make little effort to abide by the rules. Transport Canada comes in now to do an audit and they don't even look at the aircraft. They want to know the paperwork is good. The aircraft could be falling apart or not legally equipped to fly and they would never know. End of quote. Now I have to tell you that concerns me. Does it concern you? Okay, so let, let me clarify two things you brought up. Number one was about the SMS approach and the inspection, okay? When you mentioned that quality assurance does not apply and it is coming, I just want to clarify that quality assurance is applicable for an approved maintenance organization and quality assurance is in place for an air operator's maintenance requirements. Under the new SMS, under the SMS rules, the next phase coming to the regulatory framework is quality assurance for the flight operations, but that has not yet been implemented. So there's no regulatory requirements for a 705 air operator to have quality assurance. However, the maintenance aspect of the air operator, be it a 702, 703, 704, or 705, that rule is in place okay, for quality assurance. Our approach to surveillance is a systems-based approach, as we mentioned before. In the audit world, we used to go and we would say, give me your stack of paperwork and I'm going to go through it to see where the non-conformances are and I want to go and look at stuff. In the systems approach, the way we do our systems-based approach is that we do a review of the documentation of the air operator or enterprise. Then the next step we do is we go and we do interviews with the people and we do sampling. So what that tells us is that when we do the interviews, are the people responding to us, telling us what has been documented? And then we do the sampling of end product, be it an aircraft inspection, be it a record inspection. Does the output of that system correlate to what the interview told us and what we read in the documentation? That establishes whether the system is effective or not. When we look at the documentation and we get a different uh, response when we are conducting our interview, and when we look at the end product, we get a different response, then tells us that the system is broken. So, Mr. Walter, here's the problem. last 30 seconds. Okay. Here's the problem. What we're hearing from the front lines, people who are in the business, is that those those hands-on inspections are not taking place. And, and so I guess my question to you, I'll leave you with this, is who's inspecting the inspectors? And if we're not, if, if we're not getting that kind of frontline uh, response, we have serious concerns, not just about Orange. The big problem of Orange was a lack of oversight on the part of the Ministry of Health, on the part of the Board of Directors at Orange, and now my concern is that there's a lack of oversight on the part of Transport Canada. That's very, very concerning <clears throat> to us. Okay, can I respond to that? Yeah, sure you can. We'll move to the NDP and if you want to start off by responding to that. I that's with you taking the time to respond to that. Yeah, yeah okay, okay, thank you and we'll, uh, we'll move to the NDP and go ahead. Okay, so to clarify, I just mentioned earlier on was that we have issued a new version of our Staff Instruction 001 version 5 has just been issued back in August of this year. And the reason why this document was issued was in response to the Auditor General's Audit of Transport Canada's surveillance methodology. The Auditor General identified a few shortcomings in our system like you've identified. And this new version of the staff instruction is there to respond to that. Part of this strengthening of our surveillance methodology is to have a very robust 
sampling plan in place. You are correct. There was a time period where inspectors were not sampling to the degree that was required. They were looking at documentation and they were conducting interviews and sampling was not being done to the extent that the intention of the document was. This new version 5 has strengthened that process and the documentation that the inspectors do come back with have to demonstrate that they did sample end product, be it an aircraft inspection, be it records, be it a component, but there has to be some kind of a sampling to ensure that the output of the enterprise is meeting the regulatory requirements. So we have taken care of that issue that you have identified. And then we have our uh, headquarters who is going to be doing a quality review to ensure that the inspectors are abiding by the staff instruction and are doing the uh, sampling as prescribed in our policy document. My concern is that this email came today. We moved on to the yeah. NDP. I, uh, you, my, my colleague, would you like to ask? I have no problem with you asking. Okay, thank you. Chair, uh, my concern, Mr. Walji, and I hear what you're saying. My concern is that this email that I shared with you today from a major air operator came today. Today, this is what they're experiencing in the field today. So there may be a policy pronouncement, but it's not being implemented. And I just leave you with that. Collectively, we have a concern. Thank you. Uh, just Thank for you. information, when was that inspection done at this carrier? Because if it was done prior to August of this year, the new staff instruction was not in place. I'm happy to put you in touch. Okay. So to, uh, to the initial question from my colleague, uh, Mr. Cleese, was that who is policing or who is inspecting the inspectors? I guess we have the Auditor General on all levels of government that are providing that extra uh, oversight, which is very, very helpful. Um, and I, I think that's an important point that if, if this new instruction going forward is going to ensure that the sampling is done uh, in a more robust fashion so that there's actually uh, eyes on, you know, uh, actual tangible assets and making sure that the vehicles or the, uh, the aircraft are, are uh, themselves inspected. I think that makes sense. And that's, that's concern, or that's, Reassuring to hear that. Uh, I just have a couple of questions. I think I'm uh, not too much more time I'll, I'll spend, but I just have um, a couple of areas of concern. Just, just in terms of how uh, a, an inspection is done, how many inspectors, do you have inspectors assigned per province, like a number of inspectors per province? Um, or are they all a national, you know, a number of inspectors nationally and they all kind of go to assignments as needed? Or are they... Uh, a certain number per province. Okay, so, so the way we are structured at Transport Canada Civil Aviation is we have uh, Transport Canada centers. So I'll, I'll speak on for Ontario. So in Ontario, like we mentioned, we have East and West. So for the West, I am responsible for Thunder Bay Transport Canada Center, the Hamilton Transport Canada Center, and Pearson. And Eve is responsible for Sudbury, Ottawa, Buttonville, and our aircraft certification folks at uh, 4900 Young Street. Within this Transport Canada centers, we have multidisciplinary who are airworthiness inspectors who look after the maintenance of an aircraft. We have inspectors who are flight operations inspectors who look after the flight operations portion of the aircraft. We have people, inspectors who are cabin safety uh, and dangerous goods inspectors. So when we do our surveillance planning, we go in there with the approach of a multidisciplinary team uh, where we have, depending upon the size, complexity of the organization, uh, we would send anywhere from two inspectors to five, six, seven or more, depending upon are we doing a program validation inspection, are we doing an SMS assessment, uh, how big is this organization, how many bases it's got, so the number of inspectors assigned would vary there. And the inspectors would come from the TCC that they are responsible for the geographical area. So, for example, we talked about Wabisk Air. So the Thunder Bay Transport Canada Centre inspectors would be primarily assigned to do the surveillance activity. Sometimes we have a shortage of inspectors because of the, the scheduling. Then we would supplement it from other inspectors from our other Transport Canada Centres to help them uh, conduct the surveillance activity. Okay. Uh, so what would the smallest team be 
you know, and on average, and what were the largest teams? Two. Two is the so, smallest. So, so we always send a multidisciplinary team. So if you hold an air operating certificate, you have a maintenance component to that air operating certificate, and you have a flight operations component. So we send an uh, inspector for each of those disciplines. Okay. And I'm just going to turn your attention to um, just the report, um, the Transport Canada uh, report that we've been referring to. The reference number ends in 1717. Uh, on the second page, there is uh, finding numbers, and, and we've listed through there. There's nine findings, and three critical, two major, et cetera. Uh, I just want to understand what the impact of each of these things could be. I understand if you if you read through, you go into a more detailed, mm -hmm. uh, where you look at each of the um, findings, and then an example of what the finding was, and then the expectation of how it's going to be addressed. Uh, but just to understand in kind of in, in layman's terms, or just directly, what, what would be the impact? Uh, just briefly, if you could just summarize, I'll just go through, for example, um, the cabin safety, it, it's a moderate classification, so not as serious as critical, obviously. But uh, what would be the impact if, uh, when I read that, it says that basically people, all personnel weren't aware of the, uh, on their duties, uh, persons assigned on board duties, that people weren't instructed on their duties, and that became a cabin safety issue. What's the actual impact, like, in, in simple terms? If you don't know uh, your duties, what could happen? What What are the problems with not knowing that? Like, what could what does that translate into? Do, do you follow my question? If I just say to you, you know, cabin safety issue, uh, and the issue is they weren't instructed on this. Well, what is the actual impact? What could happen, or what's the the weakness that that falls from that directly? I, I could I could guess cabin safety yeah. means the cabin's not safe, but what does that actually mean? So, so in this particular example, the person of uh, who is doing onboard duties. So what happens is uh, normally the captain of the aircraft has to provide a briefing to the people in the back on safety, evacuation of an aircraft in, in, in an emergency. These are the exits. This is where your fire extinguishers are located, your first aid kit. So they give a briefing. When the configuration of an aircraft prohibits a captain from providing the briefing, they assign that duty to somebody else from the company who is going to be in the cabin who can conduct the briefing and can uh, inform the uh, passengers that this is the emergency evacuation process in this particular aircraft. So that's what the particular cabin safety finding is. It kind okay. of looks to. And, <clears throat> and so the, the, uh, in the critical areas, one of the things that came up was um, moderating or being aware of the, the flight time and the rest periods of each of the flight crew. So so the, the safety impact of that is that if you have someone who's not taking enough rest time or has too much duty time, that would impact their ability to safely fly a vehicle. Is, is that what I understand that? To, or safely fly the aircraft? Is that what I understand that to be? It, it could be. You know, okay. that, that, that's why the, the duty time and then rest time is there is to ensure that people can operate at their maximum capability and not being fatigued. You know, it, it's not so much the, the one occasion, that it's just if there is a, a continuum of not having enough rest, you know, you have, uh, you know, you, you're just a, 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 a sleep depriv depriv deprivation, deprivation, and therefore it affects your, uh, your ability to actually do your duty. It could affect your ability to do the duties. Okay. And if you could just say, uh, tell me then, what, what is, out, out of these areas that you have addressed, uh, I guess it's safe to assume that the critical areas were the areas of biggest concern. Uh, of the critical areas, what was the, the major concern? I guess if you could say what the most serious concern was. Is it, are, you, is it, are you able to say what the, you know, the biggest concern that Air Transfer Canada had? So, so what has happened is, uh, like I mentioned before, we, we had version 5 of our staff instruction that came out. And one of the changes in there was the classification of the findings because what we had uh, identified was that the verbiage of the classification of the findings was not quite accurate enough. And, and headquarters and uh, our policy people agreed that the uh, definitions needed to be changed. 
And so if you look at version 5 of our staff instruction, which is a policy on classifying findings, you will not see critical in there. It is, uh, you know, minor, moderate, and major. Um, and also the methodology of addressing that type of a classification has changed. Whilst this staff instruction version 4 was in effect, headquarters had issued an internal process bulletin to give us further guidance on addressing non-conformances and uh, uh, taking actions on, on companies where the reports were given out. So it was like a bridge between the existing version 4 and before version 5 came out. Okay, but, but given, uh, given that, and that you had some issues with the, the, the use of the, the terms and that you weren't satisfied. Now you have a new, more clear form where you have the, uh, the new kind of redefined ways of, of classifying. Uh, just applying your own analysis to this, what was the major concern that Transfer Canada had with, with Orange? Uh, if you could identify the major or one of the most important areas. I think the most important was really the, the, the lack of the training for the flight crews. Really, that's really uh, number one, is you want to make sure that the flight crew are trained before they go flying. Okay. Uh, just, uh, I might have a question for my colleague. How much time do you have? <coughs> do you have a question? You have uh, six minutes. I think, I think yeah. yeah. Uh, we're okay, no more, no more questions. Thanks. Okay, very well. Ms. Jasser? Yes, thank you. Uh, well, thank you for coming down. Uh, to help us uh, today. Uh, I guess we're trying to understand um, uh, exactly how significant these three critical findings in Orange's uh, PVI are. Uh, obviously, we know that they voluntarily um, grounded themselves and suspended operations until they uh, had uh, made the corrective action. But uh, in terms of the inspections that are done, what sort of percentage of those would result in something like a critical finding? How often would this happen? It all depends upon the organization and what we find within the organization. It's very difficult to have a percentage because we don't measure percentages or we don't really measure uh, how often that occurs. You don't measure that? No. I see. I find that strange. <laughs> you think you'd want to have a sense overall of how often these things would occur. Uh, so you're not able to make no, any so, so, so we have a system which looks at, uh, and again, that's work in progress, where we uh, do look at the type of findings. Because, you know, when we talked about the risk profiling of an enterprise, yeah and we talked about coming up with a risk indicator level and number. We look at the type of findings that enterprise had uh, received uh, from our inspection, and we take that into consideration when we are saying, okay, uh, you know, they had a lot of major findings or critical findings, so it is at that stage when we are taking this into account and consideration when we are doing the risk profiling. Is there any trend uh, in Canada in terms of uh, people moving to riskier and riskier uh, profiles, or is it in the reverse? Do we have a sense of what's happening out there? So well, one of the things I talked about was that when we do use our risk methodology system, it is more along seeing a change occurring within the organization. So when a company has a change in key personnel, for example, they get a new chief pilot or they get a new person responsible for maintenance, that is a change that has occurred in the organization. Sometimes the change can be for the better or for the worse, but we don't know. But so we say that a change has occurred. And then we see what number gets generated from our risk profile which might change the frequency as to when we're going to go back and inspect the company. Yeah, I understand the process. I'm just surprised that we don't sort of have an overview sense uh, by Transport Canada as to, with all these changes, uh, is there more and more risk occurring? I mean, one would hope that with companies being educated, and obviously, presumably, with the best interests of their, uh, of their passengers <laughs> and crew, uh, at stake that we would be seeing sort of system-wide lessening of risk. So, uh, any comment? 
What are the changes you're talking about? The the, the, the change in the uh, in the model that we use from an oversight and surveillance point of view. Okay. Uh, the reason for this change, the most critical aspect the, of air operation is that we're not there all the time. And therefore, the new the change is that we want the company to have in place systems and processes that will ensure that they will monitor internal monitoring of their performance and take action when they uncover something. Because we're not there all the time. We have to, the accountable executive is responsible when we issue the, uh, an operating certificate to comply with all the regular requirements. So that accountable executive must have in place uh, a self-internal audit capability to monitor their operation. And when we uncover uh, non-compliance, it is clear that the system has some deficiency and then that's what we expect the uh, accountable executive or his company, his organization, to actually correct, change the process to make sure that there's no gaps in their monitoring and in the performance. It's not self-regulation, it's just that because we're not there all the time, we want them to have in place procedures that will assess their performance their okay. performance and correct things before we get there then uncover it. So how do you feel when they tell you that they have an Argus Platinum rating? Does that uh, have any impact on the way that you look at their self-audit systems? Like, does that reassure you if they tell you that they have achieved that through this third-party Argus? If, if they can demonstrate that it is effective, I, you know, when we look and when we sample all the sampling, you know, that we do, and we determine that, you know, things are, are, are compliant, then we have a level of comfort, and that's when, you know, then the uh, uh, risk profile of the company may be modified, maybe, you know, from a, let's say, a, a three-year cycle, you know, they go on a four-year cycle. Has Transport Canada ever assessed the Argus uh, audit system? I haven't heard of it. So you're, you're not familiar no. with that? No. 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 Okay. It was quoted to us by many uh, of the yeah, air carriers that they use this mm -hmm, as a, mm -hmm. a way of, uh, I guess, self-auditing. If, if when we go in, we don't dis we don't uncover anything, whatever, whomever you know is doing the auditing, uh, is effective, whether it's internal to the company or it's third party or it's an independent individual and all that. That's what we're satisfied with is that when we look at the company that they are compliant. So they may have used that mechanism, oh. but as long as you see exactly. what you require. The end yeah. result, okay, when we do sampling and we see that everything is in place and the company, more importantly, the company can explain to us how they are monitoring, how they are assessing. They have internal audit uh, uh, reports, for example, whatever, six months, eight months, whatever it is, you know, and all that. And then, you know, th this, this can be used as well for us in the documentation of the company to look into specific areas, particular areas, because we, you know, we have some concern. Okay, I see. So it's, they, it's used by the company to help themselves exactly. to meet your standards, mm -hmm. essentially. Right. Okay, I, I think I'm clear. Now, maybe we could just turn to your relationship with the current uh, uh, people at uh, Orange. In fact, uh, Rob Giguere is the appropriate uh, operations manager individual that you relate to. Um, can you comment uh, how uh, often there is contact? I mean, is it uh, uh, something where you, you as Transport Canada have had uh, a positive relationship? Uh, we've heard that they suspended voluntarily at uh, the point of your PVI, etc. Can you make any comment related to how this is working between Orange and Transport Canada? So, so Rob is the accountable executive, which is at a very high level, right? And like you mentioned, the accountable executive is to ensure that the company remains in regulatory compliance. So when we have a discussion with uh, the accountable executive of any enterprise, it is when we want to stress the importance of meeting the regulatory requirements. And our relationship with uh, Rob has been uh, very positive, 
and uh, we haven't, haven't had any issues at all with uh, uh, communicating with him. And you're confident he has the issue of aviation safety uh, first and foremost? Uh, yeah. in all your the discussions we've had with him so far does show that positiveness. You know. um, I understand that you've been working with Orange on the new AW139 aircraft interiors. Uh, have your inspectors been part of that process? Our engineers. Are. Yeah, the engineers. Uh, your engineers. Yeah. 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 For the moment. And For can the you give us? Uh, are you aware of how that uh, progress? We know there was an interim solution, moving towards a, a permanent one. Do you have any updates for us on that? No, honestly, what yeah. I can get back to you if you wish. Yeah, uh, I think we have been a little concerned. It, it, it's obviously one of these issues that uh, um, there's sort of a stopgap uh, solution at the moment, yes. and, and we want to be assured that uh, we're moving to something more permanent. Um, you, you've mentioned that if you receive intelligence from either an anonymous or uh, a source who wishes to have a report back, um, are you aware of any intelligence reports that you've received concerning Orange, say, in 2013? No. I don't believe that uh, we, I have information now. Uh, okay. Uh, we, we hear a lot of, uh, <coughs> we read the paper like everybody else. I, I uh, meant to your line, like uh, say a pilot that's concerned or some sort of intelligence that things are not good in relation to Orange Aviation at the moment. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, Mr. Cleese gets lots of phone yeah. calls, I understand, <laughs> but to you? Currently, right now, I would say no. Uh, we haven't received anything over the last little while. Uh, there were some emails before with inspectors uh, after the incident that occurred in May. Yes. But after that, really, recently we have received nothing that I'm aware of. That you're aware of. Yeah. Okay, so it's not like you're getting lots of complaints no. or concerns no. related to the aviation safety at Orange. Not recently, no. 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 Okay, thank you. Um, I guess we've also been rather intrigued by the installation of this uh, traffic alert and collision avoidance system, TCAS, and also um, uh, there's the other one, the terrain awareness and warning system. TORS on aircraft. Now, what's the position of Transport Canada in terms of the need for the installation of these two systems? I, I would have to look at to what the status is and then the requirement. I think it, it's a voluntary, uh, the, the company, I understand that the company decided to install that, that uh, equipment on board, but I don't know at what stage it is. So it's not a requirement by uh, Transport Canada uh, to have this equipment? That is correct. Uh, that's correct. That do you have any plans to uh, require installation of these two systems? I would, we would yeah, have yeah. to. We have to check the regulations to see whom it applies to, yeah. because the, the regulations apply only to specific type of uh, aircraft and operation. operation where it is mandatory, then the other ones is voluntarily carriers can't put them in there. So as far as you know, if Orange is starting to require the installation, that's a voluntary upgrade. Uh, yes. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, maybe we could have some clarification sure. what the plan is for Transport Canada going forward, uh, if there is any change, and who exactly this is mandatory sure. for. We can get back to you on that. Okay, mm -hmm. that, that would yeah. be useful. Pretty much out of time, although the NDP had six minutes left of you, so uh, if you want to split that. Yeah, two, two, two. Fine. Two, two, So you two. have another three minutes then, if you want. <laughs> Actually, uh, if, if, oh. Mr. Chair, if you don't mind, I'd like to just, uh, something came to my mind that I'd like to respond to Mr. Frank Lees when he talked about the SMS on the carrier. It'll take me about two minutes to explain. Is that uh, fine, uh, Ms. Jasek? Mr. Cleese? 
Okay, go ahead. Yes. So th there, there is uh, another process we have for voluntary uh, implementation of SMS for companies where the SMS rule does not apply, and what we're calling them is SMS in transition. So what happens is carriers like the 703s and 704s who want to transition towards SMS in preparation for the rule coming down, we have a staff instruction which provides them the methodology to be considered as SMS in transition. So that might be what the carrier that you were mentioning might be an SMS in transition carrier. But it's not a full-blown SMS. It's just a small version of uh, a few elements of the SMS. Uh, so just to follow up on the TAWS system, uh, and, and you are getting back to us, uh, but information that I have uh, is uh, that particularly with regard to uh, the helicopters that are being used uh, by Orange, the Sikorskys, for example, that uh, it is a Transport Canada requirement that if you don't have TAWS, you're not allowed to fly. Uh, you, s you leave the impression that it's a voluntary, uh, uh, that it's an option. Uh, so we're, I, I have conflicting information. If you would get back yes, to us will, on yeah. that, yeah. Uh, we'd to, appreciate it. Yeah, because the, the rule will, will tell us what uh, type of an aircraft and operation requires the TOS, and yeah. we will get back to you, because we don't have that. Okay. Thank you very yeah. much. Thanks. Anything else? No, I think uh, that's fine. I, I want to thank you uh, again for, for being here. As I say, I, I think that uh, you've left us with, uh, with good information. Uh, of, of major concern to me, quite frankly, uh, are what I see as the gaps in the oversight system. And uh, we'll have uh, time to deal with that uh, at some point along the way. I'm sure you're doing the best that you can. Uh, but I do think that um, we have a problem. We have an issue here that is of a broader policy uh, nature that isn't for you to fix. Uh, but certainly, I think. Uh, Chair, it's my intention to be in touch with, with our colleagues at the federal level uh, to raise some questions about uh, how uh, this SMS system is working and uh, some things that I believe can be done uh, to tighten up uh, the oversight uh, of our air transportation system. Thank you, thank Mr. Jasek. And just simply um, uh, want to say thank you again for helping us out here and for you just to confirm one last time, my colleague from Thunder Bay was uh, obviously anxious about it that at this point in time, to the best of, of your knowledge, uh, Orange's air operations are safe. They currently hold an air operating certificate. So as far as the company is holding that certificate, they are meeting our regulatory requirements. Thank you. Thank you very much. And sir? No? Okay. Thank you very much. And thank you for coming before the committee today. It's very much appreciated. Okay. And we'll adjourn until this afternoon.
Call the committee to order and uh, welcome Mr. Ted Ribicki to the committee this afternoon. You have up to 10 minutes to make your presentation and just to confirm that you received the letter for a witness coming before the committee. And uh, you can either swear an oath or. Uh, yeah, he's going to swear the oath. Okay, we'll have the clerk swear an oath. Thanks, Mr. Ribicki. Do you solemnly swear that the evidence you shall give to this committee touching the subject of the present inquiry should be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you. And welcome and go ahead with your presentation. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, honorary ladies and gentlemen of this Public Accounts Committee. My name is Ted Rabicki and I'm a former employee of Orange. I resigned in August and left, in or left Orange on my own accord in September of this year after almost eight years with the company. The air ambulance experience was my first public sector work experience and the decision to leave was a very difficult one for me. I wonder at times how this job has inspired me and reflect if there is a linkage to other aspects of public service. You see over the 